Hi, I'm Dan Sweet, Director of Public Relations and Communications for HAI. We appreciate your joining us today. We'll get started in about a minute. We know that there's a lot of people with very, uh, who are very interested in this topic today. We wanna to make sure that they have time to join before we get started. Back and with you in just a minute. Okay, let's not waste any time. I know we're uh, gonna have to, uh, we have a hard stop today, right at the top of the hour. We're only gonna be able to go 60 minutes. And so we are probably gonna need to uh, get to some questions. Uh, before we get started, I have been asked to state that as of right now, there are absolutely no delays uh, from either 5G or from uh, COVID restrictions that will affect Heli Expo. Uh, the show dates for Heli Expo are March 7th through 10th uh, and then March 8th through 10th on the show floor. That's in Dallas, Texas at the Cave Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center. If you have any questions, please visit heliexpo.com. We're happy to uh, talk with you about it. Um, our panelists today, uh, John Shea is our Director of Government Affairs and our subject matter expert on 5G. He'll be our moderator today. From the FAA, we have Tom Lupersbeck, uh, Aviation Safety Inspector. We have Lee Roscoff, Fleet Safety Section. Nolan Crawford, Aviation Safety Inspector. George Harum, uh, Manager, International Programs Branch. And we have Zach Noble, who will probably join us for the questions. Uh, Zach is the Director of Maintenance and Technology for HAI. Our webinars are interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions. Please use the question module. Uh, that's going to be at the bottom of your computer screen. I, I'm not sure where it is on phones. We, you're encouraged to use the chat feature if you like. We will not be uh, taking the questions from the chat feature, but you can talk uh, amongst yourselves. This webinar is being recorded. This webinar will be available. The recording of the webinar will be available sometime tomorrow. We'll try to get it posted to our website and to our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to go back to it and uh, share it with friends. We uh, do have a website um, that is going to, that we've designed to help you with 5G issues and with alternative methods of compliance surrounding the NOTAMs. Um, you obviously can't click on this link on a computer or a phone. Feel free to do a screen capture. I'll leave it up for just a second, write down the address, um, whatever it takes to uh, get the information. I will show this again at the end of the webinar. Give you another uh, five or six seconds to write that down. Okay. It's, it's, I'd now like to introduce John Shea, who is our Director of Government Affairs uh, and who is going to moderate today's uh, webinar. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending this evening. Um, we have webinar two tonight of our 5G impact to helicopter operations uh, discussion. Uh, last Thursday, of course, we took a look at uh, the AMOC process and kind of did a, a high level overview of things to date uh, related to um, certain uh, airworthiness directives and NOTAMs that have been issued. Uh, and tonight we will be looking at, um, in focus here, the exemption uh, that HAI uh, had recently uh, received from FAA after filing uh, back in October. And uh, with us tonight, we have a great panel uh, from, from FAA and we're going to hear from them soon. Um, did just want to reiterate real quick uh, that website that Dan flashed up there is uh, is part of a partnership that we uh, put together with FAA to make sure that we are getting input um, directly from operators on exactly what they're facing um, as far as uh, restrictions or inability to, to operate due to um, the ADs and the NOTAMs. Uh, and we encourage anybody that is, uh, is facing those to uh, go to that website and, uh, and fill out the form that's on there. Um, that information is, is extremely helpful um, for us as we uh, work with the FAA to identify the, 
the alternative methods of compliance that would be most helpful uh, to, to you. So as, uh, as they look to prioritize the, the large number and influx of uh, administrative work that would be uh, associated with considering those, um, having uh, knowing exactly where uh, some of the, the pain points are would be extremely helpful. So thank you again for that. And uh, tonight, um, again, looking at the exemption, um, I'm going to, to kick things over to Tom Luperspeck, uh, who uh, is, if you don't know him, I imagine a lot of you do, um, uh, definitely somebody uh, that you'll, you'll want to uh, write down their name. A very, very informative uh, discussion coming up tonight. He's going to give a high level overview of what was in the petition and a number of other issues, uh, what was included, some of the key determinations. And uh, we're, we're very glad to have him. He's, he's going to be here for about uh, all of, I think, um, well, I, I'm, I'll leave it to him to tell you, but uh, I do want to get it over to him quick. Um, we're going to spend a good bit of time tonight um, uh, on questions, so please do send in uh, those as you're, uh, as you're listening. And uh, Tom, with that, thank you so much, and I'll, I'll uh, hand things off to you now. No, oh, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks to all the, the folks at HAI for having us on today uh, to discuss some of the 5G issues, uh, one of which is the exemption that HAI was granted. Um, based on the, on the Radio Technical Commission report for aeronautics information, HAI you know, stepped up well in advance of, of the activation date um, and petitioned for a 5G-related exemption. And they did so on behalf of not just their members, but, but all Part 135 helicopter operators. Normally, the FAA policy does allow us uh, for the grant of exemption to an industry group, but normally it's only on behalf of their members. So due to the scope, though, of the 5G issue and the somewhat limited time frame within which we had to work, uh, the FAA did make an exception, much as in the same way we did for COVID, uh, the COVID exemptions. So they petitioned on behalf of, of all Part 135 operators. Uh, what did they petition for? Well, the, kind of in two parts. The first part was they requested an exemption from 135 to 160. That's the rule that requires an operable radar altimeter in all Part 135 helicopters. The second rule along with that was relief from 135 to 179 which is the rules that specify, you know, if something's broken, it has to be uh, on an approved MEL. And the radar altimeter is on the MEL, but the conditions and limitations on the uh, master minimum equipment list would have prevented a lot of operations essential, especially for helicopter air ambulance operations. So the first thing we had to do is we, the FAA had to determine whether or not we were gonna consider the radar altimeters to be inoperative when they were receiving 5G C-band interference. And we did make that determination. And the determination was made consistent with past determinations regarding, for example, GPS and ADSB interference. We haven't in the past considered the, those inoperative at the time. So we're not considering the radio or radio altimeters to be inoperative when they're receiving 5G interference. So based on that, uh, the FAA, we denied the request for an exemption of 135, 160, and 179. Um, <clears throat> the second part of that had to deal with 91205H of the uh, other regulations. And section 91205H pertains to equipment requirements for various types of operations. Specifically, they addressed night vision goggle operations. Uh, in that section of the regulations, a quote, normally functioning radar altimeter is required when, when conducting night vision goggle operations. We all had to make a determination, well, okay, it's not inoperative, but is, is it normally functioning if it's receiving interference? And we determined that it, it would not be considered normally functioning. So <clears throat> along those lines and considering all those things, coming up with some uh, conditions and limitations to ensure the uh, uh, an equivalent level of safety, we granted that, that portion of the exemption. Uh, along with that, 
was a, a request for relief from section 91.9 of the regulations, which ties into 91205 and night vision goggle operations because most, if not all, of the night vision imaging system STC supplements that go in your flight manuals contain the limitation that requires compliance with 91205. So again, we granted both the relief from 91205-87 and 919. So who got the relief? The relief was limited in nature, limited in scope to only those operators under part 135 that conduct helicopter air ambulance operations. And the reason it was limited to them was because there's two requirements when one uh, petitions for an exemption for relief from regulations. The first thing that one must show is an equivalent level of safety. If you can't comply with the regulations, what will you do to make sure the same level of safety is maintained? And they showed that with, with some some things such as the use of a, of a movable searchlight, um, requiring, if at all possible, contact with personnel on the ground to try to give a, a landing zone briefing and point out obstacles. And if they can't do that, then they are required to perform a higher reconnaissance of the area before landing there. The second part that's required is it must be shown why a grant of exemption would be in the public interest as a whole or in the interest of the public as a whole. And they did a great job of showing why it would be in the interest of helicopter operations, uh, in the interest of the public for helicopter operations to continue uh, without interruption to be able to fly at night with night vision goggles. So what about everybody else? Well, interestingly, there's six or eight certificate holders out there in the country that, that have authorization under part 135 through their op specs to use night vision goggles. Um, and the exemption does not apply to them. So what are they to do? Well, we've got to consider two things. First off, the exemption is only applicable when operations are being conducted in areas that are notum for 5G interference. You know, a lot of time and energy was put into determining these areas and outside of those areas was determined the likelihood of receiving 5G interference to your radar altimeter is low. So if they're going to be operating in them, then they will require uh, an exemption to do so and be in compliance with 91205 while using high vision goggles. Um, information uh, detailing kind of how you can petition for an exemption and the things that are required, including those two things, the equivalent level of safety and the public interest statement, they can be found by going to 14 CFR part 11 and scrolling down to uh, to the section that covers petitioning for an exemption. Um, there's been a lot of questions about regarding the airworthiness directives that were issued and this exemption. Uh, I just want to point out that those two are separate, separate matters completely. The exemption does not grant any relief from the airworthiness directives. The only tie in between the two is the fact that we identify the areas where 5G interference will be uh, through the NOTAM system. And John, that, that pretty much covers uh, most of that. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them at this time. If they're related to, uh, to the NOTAM areas and how they were determined or the airworthiness directives, then I'm gonna have to defer uh, those to uh, Lee and Nolan. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that overview. And uh, we're, uh, I think, maybe getting some questions in. Uh, looks like some some typing going on in our shared doc. But uh, I, I know uh, one question that's got to be on a lot of folks' mind is, um, you know, you mentioned public interest and um, and how that was a key criteria in the decision making process. And uh, knowing that, um, you know, if you if you look at some of the operations that uh, our, our members are conducting, whether it be law enforcement or firefighting, is there, um, is there anything lessons learned from this or uh, thoughts on what that might look like if, um, for, as, as a potential avenue for, um, for, for operators that are looking at this issue? Well, you know, I'm open to discuss that, you know, e yeah. even one-on-one -on -one, since there is just a limited number of people that that would apply to. Like I said, I think it may be uh, between six and eight other certificate holders. So, so the, the public interest statement, um, 
you know, I had a conversation with, with another certificate holder that uses night vision goggles. They do so under Part 91, and they're, they're in support of a government agency. Well, that's interesting. Government agencies, when, when they're operating their aircraft, they're considered in most cases to be public aircraft operations. And, and we do have an advisory circular that, that one can Google to find that, just Google FAA public aircraft operations. And in there, it explains which rules are applicable to public aircraft operations and which ones aren't. And generally speaking, uh, a rule that contains or is applicable to civil aircraft do not apply to public aircraft operations. And that's the case with 91205. 91205 starts off with no person may operate a U.S. registered uh, powered civil aircraft. So they're a little bit on the sidelines when it comes to the requirement. Uh, other ones, other certificate holders that may be operating under Part 91, uh, one thing that's not in the public interest is something that only benefits the certificate holder. If they provide services to others uh, that benefit, you know, communities, uh, the economy of a, of a community, you know, th then that's possibly a public interest statement. One thing that I, I just want to add to that, you know, discussing exemptions or petitions for exemptions, uh, like I said, with the, with the limited number of people that that part affects, I'd be willing to discuss that. They can, they can drop me an email. Um, but once a petition is, is submitted to the federal register, then, then ex parte comes into play and we can no longer discuss it. So it's better to have those discussions with people on the front end than it is after, after it's been filed because it's we basically can't communicate with you directly without making a record of that, you know, on the public record for everybody to see. So does that answer your question, John? It does. And that's extremely helpful. It's a great tip there. Um, you know, just a, a follow up to that. Um, you know, I know uh, it seems like you mentioned it's a, it's a limited number that uh, might fall in that category, but what would what would be the best uh, route to go? Is that something where kind of collectively, like for like HAI did for for Air Medical, is that something where you would try to do it? You know, for for an entire operation segment, or is that something that's better handled oh. individually? Uh, again. You know, when HAI petitioned for this uh, exemption from these rules, they, they made a really broad sweep of, of all the rules that could possibly have been affected and large segments of the industry. It wasn't at the time just limited to uh, helicopter air ambulance operations. You know, it, it included, uh, uh, of course, uh, operations in the Gulf of Mexico in support of the oil and gas industry. So, you know, in, in this case, as I said, it was... A, a, um, an exception to our policy. We, we would normally allow a, an industry group like HAI or, or others to petition for their, just their members. But in the cases of, of everybody that kind of fell outside the parameters of what HAI petitioned for, they would need to be uh, petitioned separately for theirs. In other words, one individual certificate holder couldn't petition on behalf of all the others. That would be a pretty, a pretty long stretch and way outside of our, our current policy. Um, now, the HJI exemption has been published to the Federal Register, and people can see what was uh, accepted as an equivalent level of safety uh, for the helicopter air ambulance operation. So, so that part would be a good guideline. The public interest, they're going to have to evaluate and see just exactly what benefit that, their operations uh, give to the community or, or the nation as a whole. It makes a lot of sense and I appreciate that. Um, so I would, I would say to, to folks, if, if you're looking to, to take a look at that document, you can go to rotor.org backslash RADALT, uh, R-A-D-A-L-T. Um, and it should be the first document that you see in, uh, in that section under 5G interference. So if you are looking for that, please, uh, please take a look there and uh, you should find it with some relative ease. I'm going to move now um, to some of the audience questions. Uh, first one would be, does requesting use of the exemption mean an operator does not need to request an AMOC? Uh, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of let, let Lee Roskamp step in on this one too. But again, the AMOCs are separate from, they pertain to the, to the Airworthiness Directive uh, specifically. 
So I'm, I'm going to let Lee take over and, and kind of finish answering that one, if you don't mind. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, I, I'd just say on, on that one, uh, John, it's, as Tom was alluding to, two, two separate things. Uh, you know, if, if someone's looking for relief from, uh, there, there's four bullet points in the, uh, the Rotorcraft uh, you know, 5G airworthiness directive that talk about uh, prohibition. So if someone is specifically looking for relief from one of those, uh, those four uh, prohibitions that are in there, then, then the AMOC is, uh, is the right vehicle. Um, the, um, the areas that Tom was talking about that were addressed in uh, HAI's exemption, those were, uh, those were going to be non-compliance areas. So the, the AD deals with the unsafe uh, condition, whereas um, you know, the exemption dealt with those non-compliance areas, the um, you know, HAI submitted on, as Tom said, 135, 160, uh, 135, 179, 91, uh, 205, H7, and I think 919. So you know, just the two, two different tools to deal with two different uh, situations. Um, the exemption wasn't dealing with an unsafe condition, whereas the, the AD and relief from the AD, um, that, that's where you're in the unsafe condition territory. So that's really the delineation between the two. Well, it's really helpful to, to know that, that that key difference there as folks look at uh, what their options are, one being safety, the other one being compliance. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I know, uh, Tom, that you will be uh, having to leave shortly. So I'm trying to see if there are any other uh, exemption questions at this time. Um, but if, uh, if there are none, I may shift uh, focus uh, for uh, some of the, the follow-up from, from last week. I know there were a number of questions uh, related to the AMOC process that uh, would be um, of interest to, to folks that have tuned back in tonight uh, for this webinar. Um, and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Lee or, or, or Nolan, if, um, if there's an update to, to provide on just kind of some of the recent events this week, I mean, 5G turned on uh, yesterday. And, you know, I know there's uh, been, um, you know, a, a number of uh, additional, uh, I guess the percentage of, of the commercial fleet for air transport has, uh, has gone up significantly as far as what's been approved for the AMOC process. Uh, maybe uh, you could speak to, to, to what's happening there and, uh, and, and how some of that's being done and, and the process that's uh, going through on the fixed wing side. So I'm not gonna go too deep on the fixed wing side because uh, you can see the helicopter behind me on the, uh, on the stand there. That's, uh, that's my area of expertise. I, I will say just from standpoint since we're you know a day or so um you know into 5g c band uh being being turned on uh, you know there have been some preliminary reports that have have come in on you know various various kinds of interference i've not seen any on on rotorcraft uh, yet they've um, they've all been uh, transport airplane uh, related but i guess the key point um that I, i'd like to get to on that is is just if if you see it please report it and um, I, I think um, it may have been put in the chat, but if not, you know, the, the FAA has, has our 5G uh, website, um, you know, just uh, fa.gov uh, slash 5G. And on that is uh, the, the SAIB that was, was posted and when, within that SAIB, if you scroll, scroll down to the bottom, there's, there's the 5G uh, event reporting um, link that is in there. So I just encourage uh, folks, you know, if you encounter it, um, you know, in an odomed area, and especially if you encounter it outside of a NOTAM area, please report it because that's that's data that that we can work with to get a better idea of um, you know how this is manifesting itself and how perhaps it's manifesting itself with um, you know specific uh, radar altimeter installations on on specific aircraft. So uh, you know that will uh, as more of those come in, I think it will help us to uh, to fill in the the blanks and and hopefully uh, you know take some of the enigma um, away from this. Um, in, in terms of, you know, in some ways we didn't, didn't know exactly what this was going to look like. Well, now some of the data is starting to come in and the more of it comes in, the more I think it will help us with that. Absolutely. We'll, we'll echo those sentiments for sure. Um, certainly want uh, operators to, to mention when it does happen and, and to report. Uh, that's going to be very helpful information moving forward. Uh, only more towers going to be turned on and it uh, looks like things will be uh, that'll be happening on a pretty regularly basis um, for, for you know, moving forward. And then, of course, 
uh, six months from now, uh, what protections are in place may or may not still uh, still be there. So having an accurate uh, assessment of that will be extremely beneficial. Um, I got a question here on uh, NOTAMs that I'll bring up, uh, which says, uh, are all of the 5G NOTAMs classified as aerodome NOTAMs only, meaning of conducting part uh, 91 MBG operations operating outside of the named airport should uh, be good, should, should you be good to go? In other words, if we don't use the MBGs in the airport airspace, is it good to go? So I guess uh, moving towards um, the, the unimproved areas, uh, is, that, is that something you can speak to? So I can make a comment or two, but uh, Nolan Crawford um, worked very, very closely with the, uh, the NOTAM team and uh, he can talk to that in depth. Uh, I, I can say there were, uh, I think it was four different kinds of, of NOTAMs that are, uh, that are out there. You have the, uh, the aerodrome, the instrument approach procedure, special instrument approach procedure. And then the, the one I think that really uh, hits home for the helicopter community is, is the area uh, NOTAMs. And that, that gets into those, uh, those areas that you're uh, you know, talking about. I think in the question, John, uh, where you're, you're away from the airport, you're, you're out land, landing offsite. Uh, that sort of thing. So Nolan could, could definitely expand on that though, because he's uh, a lot closer to that topic. Yeah, good afternoon. And thank you again, uh, John and HAI for having us today. Um, Lee is correct. The, the NOTAM that you really need to be concerned about if you're away from an aerodrome or away from a heliport would be your airspace NOTAM. Your airspace NOTAM uh, will give you the general area associated with the uh, partial economic areas, or we refer to it as the PEAs, where the uh, base stations or the antennas are located. Uh, there's approximately 55 of those out across the country right now um, that will identify those areas. The airspace NOTAM is more directed at the helicopter helicopter community um, and explains, it basically lays out the four things that are in the AD, uh, the four bullet topics of the AD and, and the things you would have to do to get relief or to operate in those areas. Makes sense, appreciate that. And uh, I wanna give a kind of a shout out here. I just uh, was brought to my attention that that question was offered um, by uh, Scott Tennessand, who's uh, our 2022 HAI Salute to Excellence Flight Instructor of the Year Award. Uh, congratulations, Scott, and uh, glad you're on tonight. And uh, in fact, answer was helpful, uh, certainly seems so. And um, I'll move on to the next question here. Uh, does FAA have a sense of what percentage of the US rotorcraft fleet will require retrofitted radio altimeters for an uh, ultimate solution with 5G compatibility? I have no guess on that one at this point in time, uh, John. So yeah, I don't even don't even want to throw a ballpark out there because I'm not even in the ballpark. So I understand. Well, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be continuing to get information from from our operators as they're uh, you know assessing the the, the the rules and regulations here. And, uh, and we'll be sharing that with you guys. And, you know, I guess along the same vein, um, you know, there's, you know, obviously a, a timing factor um, with, with uh, the, the AMOX that are, are coming in. As, and as uh, that takes place, we, we've seen the airlines kind of be front and center and, and a lot of resources focused there. Uh, and there's, you know, been this real big push, obviously, for, for economic reasons and for uh, a host of other reasons with everything from the supply chain to, to vaccines. Is there um, going to be now that uh, such uh, progress has been made, uh, you know, a substantial shift that, that we can look forward to, to, to rotorcraft uh, as far as providing that same kind of level of uh, diligence to, to clearing some of the, the issues that, that we're having. I think I'd just offer on that one, John, that uh, so the, uh, 
the AMOC meetings have been um, been ongoing uh, with the uh, with the rotorcraft community. Um, you know, our technical advisor, uh, who, um, if, if you recognize his name because it's on the bottom, the AD is, is Dave Swartz, and, and Dave is uh, is doing a great job of leading those meetings. Uh, John, you're of course one of the one of the folks that uh, participates uh, in those regularly, but um, the uh, the rotorcraft OEMs are part of that. The uh, the radar altimeter uh, manufacturers. Are, uh, are part of that. And, uh, you know, I think now four or five meetings uh, deep into uh, looking at situations on, hey, wh where are AMOX uh, required? If so, you know, what's what's going to be the path forward on that? Um, you know, uh, within the, uh, the FA, um, you know, Mike Lungang is, uh, you know, who I work for, as explained, you know, there's there's basically you know four kinds of varieties of AMOX that that we would expect. Uh, you know, either one, you know, that deals with the uh, the radio altimeter itself, uh, one that is aircraft level, um, you know, perhaps one that deals with operational considerations, or maybe the more likely uh, of all is a combination of those previous three. So uh, I think you know we've um, we've got the meetings uh, on the calendar that we've held a couple last week a couple this week uh, there there are several hours in length a lot of good questions asked and and that uh, that level of rigor that you talked about with uh, you know with the uh, large transport airplanes you know we're we're digging down to that same level uh, for uh, for rotorcraft absolutely uh, definitely some great progress being made and i think the discussions are moving uh, the ball down the field a fair bit i uh, i am curious at there's thinking to the AD. Uh, there's four bullets. Um, just thinking uh, it would be helpful for uh, maybe our, our attendants, uh, our attendees, to hear a little bit about um, you know where priorities being focused now, what the thought process is there, and um, and and what that is looking like. Well, I guess to to start out with, uh, Nolan, did uh, did you want to talk about uh, the the offshore um, piece, and then I think that would uh, that kind of help on un, in understanding where where the prioritization is uh, is going to be at least in the near term. Yeah, I'll start with the uh, first bullet there on the AD, which is basically uh, performing approaches that require radar altimeters for rotorcraft and offshore operations. Um, there are systems out there that allow a more modern uh, radar, radar altimeter minimums to some of the operations offshore. That is what's affected by the AD itself. That's not saying that the industry can't still go out and do what we refer to as OSAPs, HEDAs, and ARAs. They'll just have to use the barometric side of it. What does that really mean to industry? You can still do your operations where the radar altimeter minimums uh, as set today are 203 quarters. And on the um, barometric altimeter, they start at 250 and three quarters. So there's on the initial side of that, there's about a 50 foot difference that does, again, that still allows you the opportunity to, to do that operation uh, on a day by day uh, setting. But it also, if the weather source that you're using in, in the Gulf of Mexico is more than five miles, there is a penalty that goes along with that. But you can find all that information in the AC9080 Charlie that lays out all of that information. And it's also in their uh, operating specs H104 that will give them uh, clarity on how to do the Barrow versus the um, radar altimeter side of that. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, another question just came in. Uh, during the AMOC meeting, it is suggested that AMOX would be applicable for a limited duration. Does that mean that uh, OEMs will need to reapply monthly or is that an automatically reissue of, of AMOX? So I'm not going to wade too deeply into this one, John. Um, other than I, I do know that in our our discussions today, um, you know, Dave Schwartz was talking about just that that uh, that some of the uh, the AMOX it's going to be time limited. So um, yeah, I, I would think that there'd have to be a reapplication there since there is a time limit that's established with it. Uh, but we we didn't get into depth uh, on that uh, today. But I do know that 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 time limit piece is. It was one of the things that was discussed today. And the reason for that being, you know, just the, the environment changing as additional towers go out and 
just the overall landscape uh, kind of continuing to evolve over the next few months. Is that a fair assessment of the need for that? Yes, and 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 Dave did discuss that you know, there's there's going to be um, waves of some of these um, these towers being activated, turned on, and so um, so of course the the environment changes um, with that. And, you know, other things will change as well. Obviously, the uh, you know the airspace notams have to be adjusted for that. So I think um, those time limitations uh, just take into effect the dynamic nature of everything that we've seen with uh, with five G. Um, you know, if it's not changing daily, it's only because it's changing hourly. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of been, been the pace, uh, at least since, uh, since I've been involved with it. So, yeah, I think it just takes into account that, uh, that there are going to be continue, continue to be towers that are activated and, uh, and turned on. And we, there has to be a, a reassessment uh, of all those to, to accommodate when those things happen. Absolutely. And uh, thinking to uh, the, the NOTAMs, I, I heard a, a breakdown earlier of um, how many aerodome there were. Um, or is there a further uh, breakdown that could be provided in, um, on, on which, what, what the number is for each of the three? And, and, and maybe even if they're, what are applicable to, um, to, to helicopters? And, you know, we, we've also heard that uh, the, Radio altimeter. Th these are being done based on uh, performance of the, the the least performing radio altimeter. Is that is that uh, also is that accurate? And is that um, are there any other factors that are are being looked at for uh, how how the notams are being uh, drawn up? And John, the uh, notams are are changing uh, as Lee was just talking. As we get more information on tower releases and stuff like that. That will affect the uh, NOTAMs. The uh, airspace NOTAMs, again, is the uh, one of the most applicable to the helicopter community. And of course, as more no, excuse me, as more towers are are turned on, though that the shape sizes and um, locations of, of those potentially will change. Um, the airdrome NOTAMs. I don't have an exact number of those right now. Um, I can reach back and get that and, and give those to you guys at, at a later point. But again, as the landscape changes with towers and, and as we learn more about those towers, you alluded to a few minutes ago, the six month mark things from now could change you know, even more. Um, so I, I will, I will hesitate, I'd hesitate to give you the a number because the number I give you right now may not be the same number two hours from now. And <laughs> just got your work cut out for you. I, uh, I've seen a question come in about resources and uh, I know we, we mentioned uh, earlier what the AMOC website is for HAI, but I'll mention it again for those that joined uh, more recently. That's uh, rotor.org backslash 5G dash AMOC backslash. And then also FAA has a, uh, a web page as well that is extremely informative. Uh, we would highly encourage members to take a look at this. It's faa.gov backslash 5G. Uh, both of those, a uh, lot of great information there. Would encourage folks to, to take a look at that, maybe even while we're, we're going through this conversation. And, and again, encourage folks to, to submit questions and uh, and we'll, we'll get to them. One coming in now, uh, does anyone know how close industry is to producing a certified rat alt that will not be affected in the C-band range? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I have to concur with that. Uh, on your last webinar, there was discussion from one of the OEMs that was talking about that. But they, they also, if I remember correctly, did not have a, a finite time to put a, on that answer. Yeah, I do recall that. I've, I've heard some ranges, um, most of which are you know, in, in the years. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I was just going to offer with that, John. I think it was Seth last week that, that talked about, you know, um, you, you have to get the, the, the standards for it in place and then you have to design to the standard and then you have to, you know, analyze and test to the standard. And then, then you have to, um, you, you feel, you get a certified, um, you know, field the equipment. And that's, um, 
that's a process as, as you just alluded to, that's it's measured in years, it's not measured in days, so. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly a lot of uh, uncertainty surrounding this entire issue. And, and that's really what we've been trying to um, provide for our members as they're you know, navigating these kind of uh, challenging times of, of understanding what the, the future is going to look like, how it's going to impact their, their operations. I know we just talked about a few of the resources that are out there, um, but are there others that perhaps we didn't mention, or is there another channel for, you know, obviously HAI is, is here and, and always uh, willing, you know, either through uh, our ops department or through government affairs, others uh, to, to relay those kind of concerns to you guys, but uh, are there other resources you think uh, may be available that, that we would want to mention that could be helpful? I just like the, you know, we've, it's been mentioned, uh, you know, several times, uh, but the first starting point, I, I think if you go to the fa.gov slash 5G site and see if the question is there, because, uh, you know, one of the folks that we have as a panelist, uh, you know, George Harum, he's Part of the group that's leading that communication uh, effort, and you know they've they've done a really good job at trying to get you know those those things out there in as plain a language as possible and link to all the the key areas. So I'd say start at that point. Um, if if there's specific questions about the uh, the AD, um, you know you go to the AD and there's uh, there's a couple different uh, point of contact links that are that are in there. I mean if you have questions about uh, AMOC, there's, um, you know, there's an address for that. It's AMOC at FAA.gov. And likewise, if, if you just, you know, if you have a question um, just about it in general, there's an operational uh, safety uh, email address that is, uh, that is in there. So I, I think, you know, sometimes it's cliche to say it, but really communication is, is key uh, on this um, for, for people just to ask the question, you know, that's, that's gnawing at them. And, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to, to try to, uh, try to get an answer um, to it. But for sure, if they start with the uh, FA's 5G uh, website, um, I, I think that's a that's a sound place that uh, that links to a lot of other areas where you can get answers. That's a great point. I know at the bottom of that page there is a link to uh, the news uh, newsroom uh, on, on 5G has a specific page as well. So you can go back and kind of see a timeline of, uh, of, of major events that have taken place and um, and how that how that's working. Now, and John, if I could offer up, go read the documents that are out there. The SAIB is out there. The SAFO is out there. The AD is out there. And there's there's documents out there that explains how and why the nodems are where they're at, why they're there, you know, and, and basically how to navigate that nodem field. Um, I suggest going to the source documents there. That way you're, you're getting the best information we have at the time and, and utilize that throughout your organization from, from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top to make sure everybody understands where they're operating and what NOTAMs affect them and you know what the AD really in, requires them to do, what the exemption Tom talked about gives them relief from. Uh, use the source document and, and not necessarily an off-channel source sometimes. That's if I could tag, tag on to that too, uh, what Nolan said I think is really important um, with regard to the AD. I've, I've heard some misinterpretations of it, particularly with the, with the fourth, uh, fourth bullet. So, you know, if someone's struggling with, you know, what, what exactly it means, uh, you know, just, just ask the question, um, you know, so that, you know, Let's frame it within context of an AMOC. Uh, you may not even need, um, you know, an, an AMOC. And, you know, if you're looking at the at that fourth bullet in the AD, you know, if you, um, you know, if your aircraft does not have uh, something in the rotorcraft flight manual or the operations specification, doesn't have a procedure uh, for takeoff or landing that requires, and that's the key word, requires uh, radio altimeter data. Then, then you're good to go with regard, regard to um, you know that prohibition. It doesn't it doesn't affect you, uh, but you know it's better to ask the question. You know if, if there's um, you know if there's a lack of clarity on that or a lack of understanding, you know uh, you know please one of those reference sources or email boxes that we we've, we've provided, you know uh, please reach out you know so that we can we can address it. 
Oh, that's, that's very helpful too. I, I, I'm curious, are there other uh, misconceptions? I know that's a big one um, on the interpretation of, of, of the fourth bullet, but are, are there any others that you guys are seeing or hearing that um, maybe would be useful to, to share with others? I mentioned, I guess, another one, John, that I've, I've heard over last uh, last week is that uh, that the AD uh, prohibits search and rescue uh, operations. And again, going back to the, the letter of what the AD says, it says engaging search and rescue autopilot modes that require radio altimeter data. So, you know, it's that, that's why it's, it's really important, I think, to go back to the source language and exactly what it says, um, you know, versus you know, that's pretty broad sweeping to say, oh yeah, the AD prohibits, prohibits all SAR operations. It, it doesn't, you know, it prohibits that specific search and rescue autopilot mode um, that requires uh, radio altimeter data. So, so that's one that I've heard. Uh, again, I, I mentioned, um, you know, bullet number, uh, bullet number four, um, you know, regarding the takeoff and, and landing. So those are, those are the big ones I think that have, um, have come up over, at least over last week that I've heard of. That makes sense. Is there, and I know that I'm probably asking the same question in a different way. Uh, I know this was offered by one of our uh, attendees tonight, but is there any kind of breakdown that you might, or estimate that uh, you guys could provide on what percentage would be CAT A versus CAT B as far as the overall AD or even just some of the individual bullets? Um, maybe that might provide a better uh, picture of the, of, of, uh, the aircraft that, uh, may be impacted the most? I think the, uh, the thinking when we were, we were going through uh, the, the AD process is that the bullet number four would affect, uh, potentially, potentially affect uh, the most uh, aircraft. I'm actually looking for it in the AD right now. I think we said something like, we estimated 1,800 something um, helicopters would potentially be impacted by the airworthiness directive. And I think the bulk of those we thought would be under that, uh, under that uh, fourth bullet, um, you know, probably in the neighborhood of 1600-ish or so. And then the rest would be, uh, would be spread out among the, uh, the previous three uh, prohibitions. Now, obviously there's gonna be, there's gonna be some overlap uh, between you know, each one of those, uh, those prohibition areas, but, uh, but in, in general, that's how, how we sort of envisioned that it would fall out. That's very helpful. Sorry. And I would, uh, I would encourage folks to, to continue uh, sending in questions. Uh, don't be bashful here. This is a great opportunity. And, um, and I, I know we're, we're getting questions because we're hearing them. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm not mentioning one that uh, maybe you asked before or, or sent staff, uh, do chime in. Hey, John, scroll down in your uh, oh. Google Doc. You'll find a bunch more. <laughs> Did not realize that. Thank you for that, Dan. Okay, if my rattle is not functioning properly, must I write it up as uh, unreliable or inaccurate? If Tom's still on, that would probably be a good one for him to uh, him to address versus uh, versus me or Nolan. Okay. So, not much in the same way that that again that we've addressed um, uh, GPS interference and ADSB interference. I think it's pretty safe to assume that if you are in an area NOTAM for 5G interference, that that's the cause of it. We, we don't require people to, uh, after G, encountering GPS interference, you know, and we know them those areas to do that. So uh, outside the areas, uh, that might warrant a report to, if you think it might be 5G interference outside the areas. But again, I think, you know, if the equipment passes its self-test function when you're well outside of a 5G area, that is probably uh, uh, normally operating, and then it's it's you're in the area, and it's not it's not a, a maintenance action required. That that's pretty much the consensus. Thank you. And how is an unreliable at all different uh, from an unreliable navigational uh, component such as a VOR receiver? Simply uh, saying it must be operational doesn't make it usable. And then, yeah, I think that's. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Uh, best I could equate that to 
is what Tom referred to a few minutes ago on the GPS side. Um, when you have a GPS nodem and your GPS is working properly up until you get into that node on their space and it stops working. You kind of assume that, yes, in fact, that is a, a GPS interference that, uh, associated with that nodem. I think it's safe to assume the, the same with the 5G, like Tom was saying, if you're in that area, there, there's a possibility, and I won't say a probability, but a possibility that it is 5G. We still want you to report it using the FAA website for reporting those anomalies, but it would be imperative and, and uh, smart when you get to you, out of that area to check and see if it's still operating the way it should be and functioning in a normal manner at that point. If it's not, maybe it, it is your, your equipment at that point and not a, a 5G so interference. Very helpful. So, Another audience question. Uh, when my company goes to regulations.gov website to apply for using this exemption through the letter of intent, uh, how long will it take us to, to get an approval? And the exemption question, I think Tom is still the, the best guy on the line to handle that. Uh, you can kind of glean from some of the information on the first one you guys put in, I think in October, but I just saw Tom come off mute. Okay, so I had a glitch. I could see people's mouths moving, but I only caught part of the question. Can, can you repeat it again, John? So um, just generalizing here, but uh, how long does it take to, to get an exemption through? What's, what's the time frame on that? Well, I'll tell you the, the regulation uh, uh, part 11 says you should send it in 120 days prior to needing it, but it's kind of uh, it, it, not in every circumstance, but take, for example, uh, the, uh, the HAI grant of exemption. Um, it wouldn't be a Part 91 operator or a Part 135 uh, certificate holder that uses night vision goggles, for example, might not show the same public interest statement in their, public, in their petition, but to show the same mitigations as are listed in the conditions and limitations. Occasionally, if they're if they're similar enough in, in all respects, then it doesn't take the full process that the HAI petition had to go through. These are called you know full grants or partial grants. If someone submits a petition that is similar in all respects to this one, then the review process is shortened. And that can be done now. There are a lot going through. So I hate to say, you know, two weeks, three weeks, you know, or, 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 or one. But it does shorten the process because many times uh, those go through what's called the summary grant process, where they're reviewed by aviation rulemaking. And if they're, if they're similar in nature, let's say in all respects, that, that the process is shortened. So sometimes on those, it can be just a matter of a few weeks and other times. If it's a full grant, it, it can be several months, as you well know. Well, that's I, I, I'm so vague, but that's that's the basics of it. Well, that's uh, that's helpful to clarify. Thank you. Um, so, next question comes in from uh, James Jensen. Uh, bullet four of AD 2021-2313 uh, states a Category A takeoff in the RFM uh, has heightened speed requirements, but does not specify a RA reading is Barrow all uh, suitable. I'll just I'll just get back to whether if it if it says it's not required if it doesn't require it in the RFM or in or by the by the OPSPEC, then that prohibition in the AD is is not something that that you need to be concerned about. So that's that's really the key. Is is it required? Uh, per the RFM or the uh, or the op spec. Next question comes in from uh, Christopher uh, Bader. John, we operate a mixed fleet of both uh, fixed wing and rotor wing. Our fixed wing OEMs have produced AFM supplements uh, addressing other aircraft systems that utilize RADOL data, JIFWIS, auto level, etc. Our RM OEM hasn't yet published that supplement. Uh, do you know the progress of the OEMs? 
I don't think we know the exact process of the OEMs. I will tell you that they are be they are working diligently with us uh, through the AMUC process and all. We were talking to them just earlier today, several of them, to uh, work on some of this process and 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 get the next step forward. We have uh, other meetings already scheduled with them. I believe it's early next week. Don't quote me on that, but uh, we've got meetings with them again next week to to further that process. And I anticipate seeing um, some of the AMOC, helicopter AMOC stuff coming in shortly, very shortly, actually. That's good to hear. And uh, next question from uh, Paul Kosheka. Uh, have we identified how the implementation of the 5G network was granted without careful consideration of impact to aircraft operators? Do you say that uh, one again, please? It's <laughs> have we identified how the implementation of the 5G network was granted without careful consideration of the impact to operators? That's, that's not really anything um, that we can comment on John. I mean, that's those are those are discussions, conversations that uh, you know are kind of outside the, the realm of where uh, you know Nolan and Tom and I and George um, live. So, yeah, I did really no comment on that one. I understand that. Well, what I can say on that from HAI's uh, position, if if you're interested to to hear uh, more about where you know our positions are, there there are a number of filings that. HAI has uh, submitted uh, on the FCC docket um, that kind of outline our thinking on this and what kind of consideration should have uh, been given to aircraft operators. And uh, we have been, you know, very clear um, in, in our direction and, and advocacy to uh, FCC that uh, the, the situation that we're in now is, uh, could have been avoided. Uh, had we taken a closer look at this and had we had uh, additional cooperation uh, with, uh, you know, with Telcom a little earlier, it's, it's great to see that the progress that's being made now and, and kind of the, the free flow of information. But um, again, you know, with, with FCC's help, that could have been um, d done a bit uh, more clearly and a bit more methodical manner than, um, you know, what we, what we're, currently in right now. But uh, again, if you were to go to uh, uh, rotor.org backslash rattle, um, a number of filings in there address those very issues and also include a number of presentations that we, we provided to uh, FCC commissioners and others. I encourage you to, to take a look at those. Um, the uh, other question here is Jeffrey Bird, uh, will there be a graphical 5G NOTAM resource? Something that drops into Common pilot apps. There has been some discussions uh, of potentially doing some uh, graphical work. I can't tell you because it's not a, a group that I work with, but I have heard the request and we have heard uh, the talk of that type of information where it is though I, I don't have anything to share on that. sense. Um, another question in from uh, Sally Baith. Uh, how will FAA use the AMOC data collected from HIS portal? So where, where I see the real value on that, John, and I, I think you may have alluded to it, um, you know, earlier in the, in the webinar is um, it just prioritization and, and awareness uh, for us on, you know, it's in order to address a problem, you need to know uh, in general what the problem is and 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 where it's at. Uh, so, by by you all, um, you know, standing up that that website and de-identifying the data, and then you know uh, sharing you know de-identified data with the FA, it, it can help us to to prioritize. Okay, you know, this this is where you know operators are seeing a problem. So, in terms of you know that prioritization queue. You know, this this needs to be you know higher than, than perhaps uh, something else. So that's that's where I see the uh, the value of it because um, I, I think um, for those that are you know neck deep in the in the five G world, you know every day it, it sort of feels like you're running from uh, from one fire or one crisis 
uh, to another. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, HAI's effort uh, with that 5G AMOC tool is, is to to kind of uh, you know lend some stratification uh, to the chaos, uh, so to so to speak, so we can identify the stuff that really needs to ad be addressed uh, sooner that rather than later. And if I could tag on to that, I, I thank you guys at HAI for doing that, but. Please, I, I put out, don't forget about the FAA site that's collecting these anomalies also, because that's coming directly to the FAA and the more data we receive, the more and the quicker we're going to potentially come, be able to come up with a solution or understand the problem uh, as it develops. And I did put that in the chat box earlier, the uh, link for that. Yes, appreciate that, thank you. Um, so we're getting uh, to five o'clock here and uh, a lot of questions just coming in. Um, I think maybe uh, half a dozen or so more. I'll, I'll do, uh, if you guys are okay on time, maybe one or two more. I know I might be holding folks a little over, but uh, is that something y'all can do or? Yeah. yeah, sounds good. Great. I'm um, good. Excellent. So uh, next one's from uh, Mike Deer. Uh, of the aircraft that have Category A performance that were mentioned by Lee, is there an estimate of how many actual use Category A procedures and uh, would be impacted by the AD? No, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, but as of yet, um, I have not had you know, any, any shared with me on how many uh, how many folks are currently uh, being affected by you know prohibition number four in the uh, in the AD? Um, I think my thought was as we continue to move along with these uh, these AMOC meetings, you know, some more of that may uh, you know sort of bubble to the top. Uh, but but as of right now, um, I couldn't tell you if if the actual number of aircraft affected is uh, you know ten, a hundred, or a thousand. Thank you. Uh, next one from uh, Wesley Yancey. The current grant for exemption sourced by HAI has provisions relief for part uh, 119, 135 to operate with NOP, RATOL, and relief for NVG operations, which was in the works for several months. However, what potential AMOGs would be looked at for relief to conduct ops with uh, hover autopilot modes and SAR autopilot modes? What mitigation factors are being or would be considered for alternate uh, methods of compliance? So I, I think I'll, I'll go back to the uh, the template I, I shared earlier, John. That uh, you know can either fall in the realm of uh, an AMOC related to the rat out itself, the the realm of um, you know the the aircraft, uh, an operational mitigation or, or some combination. Uh, of those of those three, so that's that's basically uh, the uh, the options on on those. Um, you know, is you do either 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 pick one that is the you know the best likelihood uh, for for you to you know see success with the AMOC, or you know if it's an a la carte combination of the three, then then that uh, that works as well. That's great, and. Uh... The next one from Anthony Rios. It is my understanding that uh, the AMOC process is requiring RADALT OEMs to estimate safe RADALT operating distance to 5G antennas per model. In the meantime, while TSA was being updated, what would be appropriate for operators to look at for RADALTs with the smallest operating radius around 5G antennas? So I, I think the heart of that question is getting to you know how how would you know that you're in a zero interference um, sort of envelope, and I, I think it's it's really too early, you know, for that for that question to be answered, and probably we're not the we're not the right folks to uh, to answer it even even if the information was uh, was available uh, right now. Nolan, I don't know if you had anything to to add on that. No, I was actually just going to suggest to reach out to your OEMs, and and they are your aircraft OEMs are in contact with the uh, with the radar altimeter manufacturers and those folks are, are working the AMOC process and they're gonna have distances uh, based on their individual 
design and and radar altimeters better than we are going to have uh, at mine and Lee and Tom's level. That makes sense as well. Appreciate it. And does the fourth bullet requirement specifically require the RFM to state a requirement for the radio altimeter? So it's the the RFM or the operation specification. So. If it, if it states it there, yes, I mean, I don't know how else it would be required if it, if it isn't stated there. So maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding uh, the, the question, but you know the, the idea on that one is that you know it, it tells you specifically in the takeoff or landing procedure that radar altimeter uh, data is required um, you know, for, for the takeoff or landing, either in the RFM or the, or the op spec. If it doesn't tell you that, then um, it's it's not applicable to your uh, your aircraft. Okay. Well, great. I uh, appreciate you guys sticking on for uh, an extra few minutes uh, to to cover some of these questions. Uh, if we missed one of your questions, we'll be sure to to take it down, and uh, we'll work in very closely uh, with this team here, and uh, we'll be sure to relay those and uh, and get responses back out. And, uh, you know, kind of in, in, in closing tonight, uh, just would like to say uh, thank you to all of you for, for coming on. Um, I, I think tonight's discussion is a, is a very helpful one. You know, as, as this information is coming out, you know, our, our job is, uh, as an association just to, you know, facilitate uh, this communication and, uh, and, and just free flow of, of, of information. So thank you. Um, for, for your contributions tonight and for all the work that you guys are doing. And uh, we look to, to keep, uh, you know, keep this line of communication open and, and to serve as a resource for you guys and uh, to can you continue working together very closely. And uh, if you guys have any, any final thoughts for tonight, uh, would, uh, would welcome those now. I just appreciate the time. Um... John and just the uh, the dialogue and uh, you know the the thoughtful questions from um, from folks and you know again uh, please you know don't don't be don't be afraid to ask hopefully we know more as as things continue to uh, to move along. Yeah, thanks so very much, John. We we do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to participate. I echo that. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Reach out to any of the three of us. Uh, we all three have our own specialties. Uh, but we, if we don't know the answer, we'll do our best to get you the answer. Appreciate that. Well, great. I'll hand it back to you, Dan. Thanks, John. Hey, and um, I'd like to add my appreciation to Nolan, to Tom, to Lee, um, and of course to uh, George and to uh, Zach, who uh, we apparently didn't need to bring on camera today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge on this uh, subject. Um, we know that uh, this is a topic that's been changing pretty rapidly, and so we're grateful for your time and experience tonight. Uh, looks like it's time to get things wrapped up, so let me bring my uh, screen back up here again real quick. I do want to remind you that this is the, uh, the web page that HAI has put together. It does have uh, plenty of information on 5G and how to uh, request the alternative methods of compliance through the FAA. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, screen up for just a second. Please use your screen capture, take a picture with your phone, <clears throat> uh, write it down, uh, the old fashioned system, and uh, we'll leave it up for just a bit longer. That should probably do it. I know we had it up there uh, to start out with a little bit earlier. Uh, save the date. Webinars uh, that are coming up, uh, we've got some interesting topics. Uh, next week, we have Human Factors with Kim Hutchings. Kim is a subject matter expert in human factors. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot that goes into it, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this uh, webinar next week. On February 4th, we have an, uh, an update on ASIAS. Um, that's the uh, air, uh, information and a, uh, analysts analysis and sharing program that HAI is a part of, a uh, very important program. And on February 11th, we have uh, the Honorable Robert Zumwalt, who retired this last fall from the, as chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. And he's agreed to come on and talk with us about uh, some of the different things that uh, he experienced as the chair of the NTSB and some of the lessons learned and what we can still look forward to in the industry in terms of safety. Um, all of those are at 4 p.m. Eastern, 
on the date shown. And we look forward to having you join us. We will get uh, registration links out uh, on Rotor uh, daily and in social media, and of course the e-blasts that we send out. We do have a questionnaire coming out to uh, those of you who are registered uh, today. Um, do ask you to take just a couple of minutes to let us know what you think uh, of today's webinar or what we could have done differently. And if there's um, topics that you'd like to see us address in the future, we're always looking for new topics. We may be uh, looking for topics right now after Heli Expo. Um, we've got things pretty much booked up until then. If you do have something that HAI can help you with, particularly for an HAI member, please let uh, Jim Viola know. Jim uh, was not able to join us today. He's the president and CEO of HAI. He loves hearing from uh, members and from people in the industry. Uh, what can we do better for you? Uh, send him an email at president at rotor.org uh, with your challenges, with your comments, your questions, your thoughts. We're looking forward to seeing those as well. This does conclude our webinar for today. We do appreciate that you took time out of a very busy schedule to watch this. And we look forward to joining you again very, very soon. Until then, please fly safe and be safe.